I can't remember what. And which type of aircraft were you at this point? We are in the Fugger Wolf 190. Okay, so you're, you're in the 190 at this yeah. point still. Okay. And uh, flew back, and that was, there was no problem. Uh, we, they didn't make us escort these uh, uh, Jungers. Ju 88s, which was actually a fast bomber, uh, supposed to drop supply containers. So never made it all the way to Brest. No. And uh, they didn't even give us, a, give us a map of France. Uh, I flew by compass. West is to Brest. East is home. You could have been way off course. I could have, been. but you flew with your hoping that your buddy knew better. <laughs> So then what happened? Well, uh, we were uh, on, on the way back at one time, somebody yelled, uh, Mustangs, on Mustangs behind us. You know the Mustang at the P-51? Yeah. And uh, we were told when it says Mustangs, you go about five feet above ground and fly there as low as you can. And <laughs> we went down and uh, one of them yelled, my first name is Fritz, Fritz, there's one behind you. And he hadn't even said behind you when I saw uh, the Mustang go by and the guy made. And I waved right back and he went around and then he fired. But he didn't fire on the fuselage as that, he fired at the wing. And I cut everything and uh, ready for belly landing. And I put the, the tail down and slithered across the landscape. Uh, it was sort of wet soil. And then there came those trees and I smacked into them. Uh, my mouth was a little bit cut here when I... Uh, Hit the instrument panel. Do you still have, is that the scar from that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know much about it because I lost consciousness. I woke up in my own vomit. You do that when you have a commotion. And then I remember commotion of brains, that's what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember waking up in a hospital and a doctor coming and saying, you are not bad off, you will be all right. You, Can mentioned, I? you mentioned to me before, I, mean, I don't want to interrupt yeah, you, sure. but you mentioned to me before that the plate was loose and it came yeah, behind you the, and hit you in the head. Well, there is, in the Focke Wolf 190, there is a silhouette of a head and the shoulders. And that head silhouette, that has a uh, rod behind it, which can be undone here and folded forward so that the uh, uh, radio people can up work and repair whatever the radio sets behind you. And they had done that, but they did not anchor that rod that holds the, that hit me, and uh, I still can feel that indentation in my skull. That may be is the reason why I vomited. But I did feel too bad, with a miserable headache. And uh, they discharged me from the hospital and uh, after two days and back to the outfit, but they were already, uh, had already taken off, believe it or not, to Schleswig-Holstein, to the North Sea, north of Hamburg. What rank are you at this point? Corporal. Still a corporal. But uh, one uh, night, we are now in May 45, uh, the pilots were called to the squadron commander. It was still the same one from the transport, Bruce Miller, first lieutenant. He said, tonight we will most likely take off and fly escort for uh, a flight of JU-88s to go to the Alpine Redoubt, clear across Germany. And we have what we call Sitzbereitschaft. The pilot is supposed to have the parachute strapped on, sit in his plane, 
and on a green flare fired start engine and taxi around and take off. Yeah, it got about, it got dark, it was about, that we are now in May, I think it was May 6, 45. Uh, I was sitting there and started to doze off and somebody rattled the, the uh, rudder and I cranked back the canopy and said, leave me alone, must be a war. And I looked at a Sten gun and a British soldier with one of those helmets. Said, Come on around, Jerry. Come on around, Jerry. So I raised my hand. I won't do a thing. You know, at May 6, you don't want to do anything. Come out. Come on out. So I went, heaved myself out and did the parachute and <coughs> went, wanted to unstrap my rifle. He said, ah, 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 no, no, no. He knew that we had, uh, here, P, uh, P30, the PO5. PO8. PO8, PO8. <laughs> Strapped on the right leg. And he said, ah, ah, ah. He said, you can have it. You can keep it. You can don't do anything stupid. So I got out and uh, somebody on a motorcycle came. Come on, all you guys follow me. Well, the, he draw, it was an Englishman who spoke German. He went to the flight control room. There were all the pilots. And in came uh, an English parachute first lieutenant who spoke flu flawless German. And he said, well, we are on the way to Copenhagen. We have no known that the Russians want to occupy Denmark. We want to prevent that. It is in your own best interest not to interfere with the British armed forces. Because we want to occupy Denmark so the Russians don't get it. Any questions? So we could go. Uh, uh, somebody then asked, do you want our weapons? No, you keep them. And we went back to our quarters and then uh, uh, the British, a couple of days later, or the next day, next day, came with a truck and we had to get on the truck and they trucked us to some village where we were housed in a, in a barnyard. And then somebody came and collected the pistol in 08, the 08. The war's over. We were so damn glad. Some of them got drunk every night. They, uh, the farmers, you know, had booze and we had cigarettes and, and I didn't, but I was so glad that the war was over for me. How old were you? 1945, I was 23. And you were an Unteroffizier. So. When's the last time you saw your unit commander? Yeah, yeah, in, in, in Schleswig-Holstein. Because I was told later that he was in the, that, that the P-51s were strafing an airport, and he was one of men who ran out and was shot. He was not uh, with us uh, there in, in, in Schleswig-Holstein. He was not with us anymore. I saw him last maybe August or July, August 45. He was a good guy. Werner Böse Miller was his name. An Oberleutnant? Oberleutnant, regular, arm, regular Air Force. Was ready to land the Focke-Wolf 190. I happened to see him. I, I, I saw her slow and approached and did the right thing, went down and gave it a little bit more gas and just, as they used to say, zieh mich hin, pulled myself to it. Got across the fence, cut it and set her down. She was not too difficult to fly because she had the very wide view uh, uh, undercarriage. The Focke Wolf had the white one. The Messerschmitt had a very narrow one, and 
would easily bounce and <coughs> that was a real you know you had a hundred and sixty one hundred and forty miles per hour and it's, it's very fast and it's very very stubby wings so at this point you're considered a qualified single engine fighter yeah. pilot and they transferred you they transferred no they transferred the whole bunch oh, we. to the Rhineland. I don't know which base we were at. And we were supposed to fly escort to transport out, one transport outfit with JU-88s, which were supposed, and they did, support the fortress garrison of Brest in the Brit in Brittany, all in American occupied already, but Brest held out. They were supposed to drop supplies onto Brest, and we were supposed to fly uh, escort to them. And fortunately, things clouded up, and uh, over the radio they said, fighter escort, turn back. Sure. <laughs> We turned back. When did you graduate the Hitler Youth? I was supposed to graduate in 1940. The war started in 1939. So in 1940, early January or February, we were 12 boys in my class, small high school. We went and enlisted. Uh, for the military service. But they didn't take us right away. They said, as soon as the paperwork is done, you will be drafted. And we hoped that we wouldn't have to go through the final exam. That's why we <laughs> listed. Not for patriotism, but to avoid the final exam, the abitur. If you were drafted, you got a note that you passed uh, the requirements except for the final examination, which you definitely would have also passed. Was this final examination regarding school? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, when you were still in school, as a, as a young man, what were your feelings when Germany blitzkrieged in the Poland? Excitement? Excitement in as much, and depression, in as much as my brother was drafted and he was in an infantry battalion and he, it wasn't legal, but he phoned my parents that they were right in Silesia at the Polish border. So when the war started, my mother came into my bedroom and cried and cried and said, well, tell me, why are you crying? Oh, war has started. And my brother's name was Gerhard. Gerhard's, I'm sure Gerhard's group is involved. I hope nothing happens to him. And I said, Mother, please, it just started. And they, they, they do the invasion with, with tanks and armor, not with infantry. And indeed, he was not hurt. And on Christmas 1939, he was uh, released from the army because he already had five semesters of medical school. They needed medical officers, so the medical student who had already uh, a certain amount of schooling were released from the troops in the army. And however, they were still under martial law, but they lived at home, didn't get any money, but could finish medical school. Really? Mm -hmm. That's what Matthew always said. What is your son doing? Oh, he's patriotic. He studies medicine. So when you graduated, you tried to enlist in the military. Yeah. And you initially tried to enlist in the Luftwaffe? Yeah, because I didn't want to walk, and I didn't want to be on the ground. I, my ideal was that I became a tail gunner, sit there and look out and do nothing. And uh, when I was drafted in 41, February 3, never forget it. Uh, 
in Duoschatz, Fliegerausbildungsregiment 63, äh, Training Regiment 63. That was just an infantry boot camp, three months, February, March, April. But it was Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. Did, now you were, if you were, did they draft you into the Luftwaffe because you'd already applied for the yeah. Luftwaffe? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when those three months were over, 30 of us out of a regiment of 2,000 were transferred to Anwärter Lea Battalion, Candidate Teaching Battalion, pre-flight. Uh, during boot camp they examined all who had volunteered for flight service, were, uh, had to undergo a pre-flight examination, like on a chair, where, which they turned, you got dizzy, and then you had to walk in one direction. And you had to write an essay, you had to, uh, you were tested in geography. We high school graduates had it easy. Those boys who were burning up to fly, but didn't have that schooling, they didn't have it so easy. Many of them had to try three and four times to repeat the boot camp until well, let's go back to boot camp. Yeah. There, there's, there's some mysteries about the German boot camp yeah. to those who have been through American military boot yeah. camp. It's, it's speculated that the German trainee in boot camp uh, had more insight as to soldiering tasks because of being in the Hitler Youth and the marching yeah. and the cross-country yeah. treks yeah. and the map yeah. reading. Yeah. Would you say that uh, boot camp was very strict? It was awfully strict. Uh, both the barrack life as the uh, training uh, on the barracks yard. First came the marching, and then rifles were issued, then the rifle training, and then firing. Uh, you had to fire, I think, 15 rounds, and the German uh, targets have 48 rings around the center. And in the middle is one, and the 48 is the worst. And if you had over five, I think, you uh, <coughs> had to do uh, evenings an extra uh, duty uh, because many of them didn't know how to run the, the, the site right. and didn't hold steady enough and had to go do gymnastics to make them fit. Fortunately, I was a, what they call, and my dad was a sheesh who likes to fire rifles. So I knew how, how to handle that. How, how was one addressed by the instructors? and Flieger? Flieger. Flieger. Flieger boost. And then if he gave you an order, how would you reply to him? Jawohl, Herr Unteroffizier. Yes, well, Mr. Corporal. And then when... Was, <coughs> Unter was an Unteroffizier considered a sergeant? No, he was... He had those... I saw one. Yeah. He had... Those... Uh, pipings on his shoulder and around the collar. So when was he considered a sergeant? When that pipe when closed up that loop and had one star, that was a Feldwebel. Two stars was an Oberfeldwebel, three stars were a... But all, everything you went through to date is prior to the July 20th assassination oh, attempt. Now that was 44. Right, but w I know that when that happened, everybody have had to uh, give. Now uh, what's the difference in, in term from the military salute to the to the Nazi party salute? Uh, this was supposed to Deutsche Gruß. That's Deutsche Gruß. Yeah, and this was the military, the militärische Gruß. Okay. We said so deep is it <coughs> in Russia. Tell us that whole joke. You told Joel Kinney that joke one time. Now it's time to tell the camera and tell me. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs>
the front line outfit, 7th Squadron, 2nd Wing, Transport Group Number 5, July 21, 1944. Our squadron commander, they lived at very comfortable quarters. We were in some not so good ones, but at least it was beds. Fall in, fall in, and we started to mutter. Well, again, some of that stupid infantry service. Just fall in and I'll shut you up. Okay. Uh, he said, uh, yesterday there was an attempt on the Führer's life, and somebody in the ranks muttered, did they hopefully succeed? No, they did not succeed, he said. He had heard it. Uh, and uh, by order of, Fjord, of, of Reichsmarschall Göring, the military salute is not to be used again by the armed forces, but the Deutsche Cruz. You know how to do that. Jawohl. <laughs> he called, uh, oh, I think he was a private first class of our technical staff. He called them Meyer. Meyer, come for. Meyer, yes, sir. Meyer, show us the proper way of the German Cruz, of the Deutsche Cruz. So Meyer <laughs> just. <laughs> raised his hand, his elbow a little bit. Meyer, do you know what that means? Oh, yes, Herr Oberleutnant. What does it mean? It means so deep is a shut shit in Russia. Back to your finishing training. Yeah. Did you go home on leave at that point? One weekend. One weekend. Just a weekend after all this time. No. No 16 days. 16 days I got at the end of flight training. Okay, so then you went on to more training as flight training, or you went to your unit, which came first? No, uh, basic training, pre-flight training, is just a repetition of basic, and then the uh, pilot training. And the pilot training was open-ended, was not set uh, in a time frame, because they, they had to decide, these become fighter pilots, these become bombers, these become transport, these are future flight trainer, flight instructors. And uh, at the end of flight training, everybody individually, not the group, got 16 days of leave. Supposedly 14 days at home and a day of travel at each end of the 14 days. Did you say that you initially didn't go on to be a pilot? But you went to be a machine gunner. I wanted to be a, a machine gunner or a, a, what they called Fliegerschütze. I, I wanted, because my ideal was to sit in a, at a machine gun port, hopefully nicely upholstered and look out and fire if somebody comes too close. Which type of machine gun would be in that position? That would be... Um, the machine gun MG-15. MG-15? Yeah, yeah. Were they, when did you receive training on that machine gun? No, but they decided when they did the uh, aptitude tests that I would not become a tail gunner, I would become a pilot. There you had no choice anymore in that pre-flight training battalion. They decided where you go. Oh, so you never were no. a machine gunner? So you went straight to become a pilot. Yeah. You scored rather high on your tests, didn't you? I, th I did. So you became a pilot. And how do they decide which type of aircraft one's going to go to based on scores only or physical or everything combined? Everything combined. Navigation, flight safety, whether you uh, came always into high or too low or... So I was fit for bomber and uh, multi-engine. What made one fit for bomber and multi-engine versus a single-seat fighter? That is one of the secrets of the German Air Force that I never... <laughs> uh, they, they selected those for fighters who 
would do the non-permissible non stunts. Uh, because you own, in flight training, you go through single engine, and it's, it's called A2, A2, where you have to do um, a figure eight flying with a barograph in, in the airplane that you don't go up and down, that you are able to hold and turn properly. You had to go, I think, for 12 hours, broken up into segments, across country to map reading, just got an order fly to Berlin. Well, not Berlin, they didn't allow flying to Berlin. I had, for instance, one time to fly to the Oder Bridge at in Silesia, where the Oder River uh, comes in, or traverses a uh, sort of a lowlands, and there is a, it's a aqueduct. And in, in arches, and I had to supposedly fly by and count the arches. And I flew by, counted the, uh, the second number wasn't right. You know what I did? It was dry, it hadn't rained. I landed on the nearest crash and <laughs> wrote it down. Took off again, no problem, and told uh, my flight instructor how many arches there were. <laughs> and you landed? Uh, in La well, it was a s uh, single engine trainer plane, double decker, wow. biplane. Well, when you were in training, I mean, you show up to the training base in civilian clothes or in your Hitler Youth uniform? No, no, in civilian clothes. And um, we were supposed to bring a small suitcase. And as soon as uniforms are issued, you were supposed to pack them up and fill out an address label. And the first sergeant, with the help of the regular personnel at that uh, base, would mail it home. You were not allowed to keep civilian clothes uh, after one week in the military. I see. So they issued you your uniforms. Was all the insignia already sewn on? When you are as a recruit, there are no insignia. <laughs> what about the breast eagle? Now that's that's part of the of the uh, standard equipment. Okay, but, but the but the collar tabs are not there. The, the tabs, one tab for. Single rank flieger. Okay. Okay. And then, during flight training, I was promoted to <laughs> private first class with one wing and a chevron on the uh, upper arm. Well, how did? Uh, what time would you wake up and during training? What what time of the morning? Basic training yeah. or flight? Basic training. Six o'clock. The. Uh, Corporal in charge of quarters would blow a whistle and yell, Aufstehen! Aufstehen! And go through the corridor and blow his whistle for all he's worth. Inside he Inside, blew yeah. And if he had a special knack for some group that he didn't like, he opened the door and blew his whistle there, which was a very rude awakening. Oh, I bet. Well, yeah. then what changed in the flight training? In the flight training, uh, not everybody had to get up at the same time, depending on how each group, uh, flight group, was supposed to do what training. Uh, they finally opened the door and aufstehen, aufstehen. As a Zeit, it's time, aufstehen. You know that was. As a Zeit? It's time to get up. Aufstehen. That's interesting.